Okay. Um, so now we're going to do um, meditation that uses verses, and I want to explain a little bit how to do a meditation using verses, um, because there's a lot of mind training texts out there, and uh, we want to approach them analytically, and it's good to kind of know the process. So I'm just going to explain very briefly, and then I'll um, walk you through it. So when you have a, a text like this, it's really important to get commentary because some of the verses are obvious what they mean and some of the verses aren't obvious what they mean. So if you're gonna do a meditation, you need to already be friends with it or else have someone lead you through it that has the commentary. So if you were to do this on your own, um, I would pick maybe three verses that you really love and then write next to each verse the commentary explanation, like this line means this, and this line means this, and this line means this, and just really reflect on what is the meaning on the verse before you meditate. Get really clear. Don't just come up with your own impressions. Make sure you know what's intended by the verse. And then when you actually sit down to meditate, it's like the verse is like the verse of a song. Um, so if any of you are musicians, um, you know, different notes have a certain amount of beats, you know, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, right? So you might start with the first line. Um, we're going to be looking at, uh, for example, verse 52. Yeah, so if you feel like it, you can turn to, to verse 52. It's on page 13. Um, and what you do is you basically, you know, you read the verse to yourself, yeah, and then you read it again, giving, you know, 5, 10, 15 beats to the line, you know, just really um, let one small part of the verse sit with you, yeah, and then rest, yeah, and not rest like relax, collapse, forget, but rest in the same way as if you were a musician and you're reading the music and you come to a rest. It means that you're awake with the space. Do you know what I mean? You're awake with the space. So if I say compassion is good, you're all like, yeah, compassion's good. But then rest and give, give that concept space, a really active, vivid quiet an active, vivid quiet so that the concept you understand and believe intellectually can kind of imbue and sink in and resonate with all the other experiences you have of that simple truth so that it enriches. And then you continue with like the next line of the song, right? Or, the, you know, and you make sure that you give beats or you give time, you give space related to the content. So some of the content is uh, linking and some of the content is uh, deepening. So when you're doing a meditation, what you wanna do is ask yourself, is this section linking me from one concept to another or is it explaining a concept? So if it's explaining a concept, just stop there and be with the concept. Let your mind think about what the commentary refers to and then ask yourself what your response to that is. So of course you're making it personal. Of course you're asking yourself, what is my opinion? What is my experience of this? But start with first what's being said. Yeah, first what is the author saying? And then what is the commentary telling me about the intention of the author? And now what is my response to that? Yeah, so you kind of go through these layers. What is being said? What is being intended? How do I respond to it? Rest. Yeah. And you rest in such a way that you feel vividness with the verse. And then if the vividness starts to kind of, you know, get dull or forgetful or it's losing some life, then you move on to the next section. So um, that's a way to do an analytical meditation or more like a reflective meditation on verses such as this. And it's important to have a bit of a plan before you start because you're not really doing a meditation if you're trying to figure out what the author intended. 
You need to first know what the author intended and then deepen your understanding of that. So you go, oh, okay, he's saying self-cherishing is the enemy. Now you have to really unpack what does it mean that self-cherishing is the enemy? What is in his intention in saying that? This is very active, very vivid, very structured. And the reason that you put yourself through this discipline is that it leads to the result intended. So if you have an undisciplined approach, you'll have a watered down effect. It'll still be an interesting contemplation. It'll be sort of interesting food for thought. You know, it's worth a conversation. Um, but when you're doing a meditation, you want a plan and a goal. The goal is, may I connect more deeply with the intention and bring it into my daily life. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to walk you through it. So you don't have to be reading if you don't want to be reading. But if it helps you to focus your mind, I'm going to be going through starting from verse 52. Um, but if you'd prefer to just listen, that's completely fine. So you don't need to read if you don't want to. It's really about your preference. Okay. So just come back to a good meditation posture that feels stable. And now come back to your motivation. Something along the lines of, may I be the peacock in the poison grove? May I use samsara and not be used by samsara? May suffering and temptation be used. May I not be used by it. May I see the real enemy to my peace of mind, the real enemy to my development of wisdom, the real enemy to my compassion as being the self-centered attitude of self-cherishing. And because that is the real enemy, may I seek to destroy that. freeing myself. And having been freed, I'm able to pursue the utmost limits of the spiritual experience. My development will be less hindered and I'll achieve full awakening. So try to frame that idea of altruism, transformation into your own words. And shift your focus back to the breath, allowing surface distractions to subside.
And so now contemplating the verse, 52 reads, frantically running through life's tangled jungle, we are chased by sharp weapons of wrongs we have done, returning upon us, we are out of control. This sly, deadly villain, the selfishness in us, deceiving ourselves and all others, as we capture him, capture him, fierce Yamantaka, summon this enemy, bring him forth now. So we are running through life's tangled jungle. Running through life's tangled jungle. So much is unseen, so much is confused, and it's difficult to see what is ahead of us. And even though we are not sure what is ahead of us, we are frantically running chasing pleasure, avoiding pain. And we are chased by the sharp weapons of wrongs we have done, karma returning upon us. We are out of control. We are controlled by the sly, deadly villain the selfishness in us. The selfishness in us is what is controlling us. It's what's narrowing our focus. It's what's making small problems seem large. It's what makes us take things so personally. It's what makes us feel wounded, unsupported, and alone. And yet it lies and says, I am helping you. I am protecting you. If I don't say me first, no one will look after you but me. It lies. the selfishness in us, deceiving ourselves and all others, all others as well. And so let us capture him, capture him with the support of fierce Yamantaka, summon this enemy so we can see him, bring him forth now. So we request the outer Yamantaka, both definitive and interpretive. The embodiment that we might observe in front of us, as well as the deeper meaning of wisdom of all enlightened beings. We ask the outer and the inner Yamantaka, bring the selfishness to the forefront of our mind so that we can see it, see how it operates see how it's dysfunctional. Not just leaving it as an abstract concept or something that reminds us of other people or reminds us of our past. Bring it forth in the present moment vividly. Know our own self-centeredness. Know our own self-cherishing. Capture him, make him hold still. And so you can use memories and you can use your impressions of others to try and evoke a sense of what self-centeredness, self-cherishing is like. But don't let it stay at that level. Try to make it vividly occur to you. How is it present in this very moment?
the one full of needs and can'ts and won'ts and shoulds. The one that says this is too much or this is not enough. And sometimes this self-cherishing is very subtle, seemingly benign, polite, manipulative, passive aggressive, socially acceptable, and yet still keeping our focus narrow, limiting both our happiness as well as limiting our ability to benefit others. It becomes very fixated on temporary things, on momentary reliefs, instant gratification. It's the one that gives us permission to forget the big picture. That one full of justification that makes us procrastinate and put off things that are important those important things that we actually love and cherish and want to do, but are challenging. Self-cherishing says it can wait some other time when I'm more organized, when life is less busy. Self-cherishing tries to soothe us with pretty lies. Find him. Summon him. Like a criminal summoned before the court of your wisdom. And in the court of your wisdom, the judge and jury are your bodhicitta, your compassion, your kindness, your patience. And they've come to a verdict. Self-cherishing is to be executed. This is the one and only case where the death penalty is appropriate. And nothing about this is an act of self-harm. Everything about this is an act of self-liberation and a way to expand ourselves to be of benefit to others. And so now sit with, how do I feel about that? What is my response to that?
and the verse about summoning now leads us to verse 53, which reads, batter him, batter him, rip out the heart of our grasping for ego, our love for ourselves, the false self. Trample him, trample him, dance on the head of this treacherous concept of selfish concern. Tear out the heart of this self-centered butcher who slaughters our chance to gain final release. Batter him, batter him, and trample him, trample him. Repeat it two times, meaning we need relative bodhicitta and we need ultimate bodhicitta. We need the method side of the path. We need the wisdom side of the path. And with these two bodhicittas, we can rip out the heart of our grasping for ego, our love for ourself, the self-cherishing self, the pretender, the facade, so much of our life is spent building and maintaining the pretender. Building up this name, obsessed with this form, organizing its logistics. And that isn't even the self that conventionally exists. Illusion upon illusion. And we love it so, this mirage, this hologram, this projection. We love it even more than the actual self we love it even more than our loved ones, our family. And we must tear out the heart of this self-centered butcher because he slaughters our chance to gain final release. He keeps us in samsara with our craving and our grasping and our craving and our grasping. Makes us content and even obsessed with temporary pleasures that always let us down and finish. Limits our reach so we don't reach the stable, lasting happiness of Buddhahood awakening. Limits our happiness and limits our ability to benefit. Makes us content with being a condition for symptoms relief. For others, we are a condition for samsara symptoms relief, gently making samsara easier for people, reframing it so that it's more comfortable, adding cushions to their prison cell, which is kind, which has its place, but is so much less than what we could do if we transformed our mind and overcome self-cherishing. If we did that, then we could actually offer tools for them to free themselves from the prison rather than just helping make it more bearable to be there.
And so this is the meaning. How do I feel about it? What is my response to it? Batter him, batter him. Rip out the heart of our grasping for ego, our love for ourselves. Trample him, trample him. Dance on the head of this treacherous concept of selfish concern. Tear out the heart of this self-centered butcher who slaughters our chance to gain final release. Do I merge with these ideas? Do I bring them home as protection and inspiration? Am I reactive to them? Am I confused, clarified? Just know your own response. There's no need to manufacture a response. Just be with it, with curiosity and openness. which leads us to verse 54, which reads, Whom, whom, show all your power, O mighty protector, za, za, tie up this enemy, do not let him loose. Pay, pay, set us free by your might, O great Lord over death. Cut, cut, break the knot of selfish interest that binds us inside. And so these mantras are repeated twice, again, because we need relative bodhicitta and ultimate bodhicitta. We need method, we need wisdom. Whom, whom is the seed syllable of perfect wisdom. It's the essence of the meaning of Manjushri, of Yamantaka, the core of the energy of wisdom. By saying it, we invoke it externally and encourage it internally. Whom, whom. And in so doing, we ask, show all your powers, O mighty protector. Mighty protector being Yamantaka. outer yamantaka, the forms, the representations, the embodiments, that which is a catalyst for our inner change, that which is the powerful condition for our inner development. By requesting it to show itself, we realize that it was already there, all pervasive, accessible as soon as we open. And 
And then the definitive Yamantaka, the definitive mighty protector, the union of method and wisdom. not as alternating practices, no longer two tools that we use one by one, but the fundamental unification of a completed path. This is the real or the definitive Yamantaka, the perfect combined method and wisdom. With Zaza, we're asking, help tie up this enemy. Do not let him loose. With Pei Pei, we ask, set us free by your might. O great Lord over death, Yamantaka. Cut, cut, break the nut of self-interest that binds us inside inside cyclic existence, inside the prison of self-obsession. By tying up self-cherishing, we set ourselves free. By cutting the knot of our self-interest, we're no longer trapped within samsara, no longer driven by long and desire. And so that is the meaning. What do I think about it? How do I respond to it? which leads us to verse 55, which reads, Appear Yamantaka, O wrathful protector, I have further entreaties to make of you still. This sack of five poisons, mistakes and delusion, drags us down in the quicksand of life's daily toil. Cut it off, cut it off, rip it to shreds. And so we again request inner and outer support in wrathful form, transformed in purified anger, destroying what needs to be destroyed. The sack of five poisons, our body is filled with them 
meaning the delusions of longing desire, fearful and angered repulsion, close-minded ignorance, arrogant pride, jealousy. This is what drags us down in the quicksand of life's daily toil. This is what makes life harder than it has to be. This is what makes us hurt other people. Sack of five poisons. Given to us, given from us, from the self-cherishing thought. May we cut it off, cut it off and rip it to shreds. Freeing ourselves, expanding ourselves, understanding the actual self. And so this is the meaning, but what does it mean to you? What does it mean deeply? What to do about it? And so then we bring it together with verse 56, which reads, we are drawn to the sufferings of miserable rebirths, yet mindless of pain, we go after its cause. Trample him, trample him, dance on the head of this treacherous concept of selfish concern. Tear out the heart of this self-centered butcher who slaughters our chance to gain final release. We are drawn to the sufferings of miserable rebirths, pulled like a magnet, because we're so used to believing the lie of an independent self, because we believe the lie of the independent self, we are quite certain it needs to be protected we're quite certain it needs to gather things to it. And so mindless of the pain this law gives us, we go after its cause and reinforce it. But we've met Yamantaka in the sense that we've met wisdom, teachings, 
which is in some way resonated with our inner wisdom and has developed and deepened our inner wisdom. And so instead of chasing pain, now we trample the cause of the pain. We dance on the head of this treacherous concept of selfish concern. Dance with delight, we finally found the problem. And we tear out the heart of this self-centered butcher who slaughters our chance to gain final release. In tearing out the heart of the self-centered butcher, our good heart, our bodhicitta heart, expands, develops, radiates, fills us with joy, brings joy to others. We've been protecting the wrong heart. This is what it means. What do I think? Ask yourself, what lands, what doesn't? And then dedicate, may we summon, observe, know what the real enemy is so that we can destroy and free ourselves so that we can be of greatest benefit to ourselves and others. And so now we just have a little mini break on our seat just to refresh ourselves. And now um, the next meditation is going to be the same idea, but now it's going to be up to you because I'm going to give you verses whose meaning is obvious. So um, if you don't have your book next to you, go ahead and grab it. So you need the Wheel of Sharp Weapons. Um, electronically or physically, doesn't matter. And we're going to look at verse 57. So in the hard copy, it's on page 14. So from verses 57 until verse 95, verses 57 to 95 have obvious meaning. So it doesn't need as much commentary because it's more explicit and direct, especially because you guys have all studied before. And so you don't need to read them all, just start. Um, read one verse and stop, pause, rest, really actively and unpack the verse and all of the little increments of its meaning and then sit with what is my response to that. Okay, so just start with verse 57 
and then go as far as you want to. I, I, no one's going to probably get to verse 95. There's no rush or speed. This is your book. Take all the time you like, but just start kind of engaging with the process and see how it goes for you. So um, together we'll set our motivation and then um, start doing this analytical process um, on your own, in your own speed, starting with verse 57. And so we'll set our motivation together using the Shakyamuni Buddha mantra. Taya taya maha And once you feel that the motivation is firmly revived, begin your analysis at your own speed. <laughs> 